we're going to take a tour of an N-scale model railroad based on the steel mills in the Pittsburgh area. So let's get going right now. Hi, I'm Tom Kovacek and this is Tom's Trains and Things. While I was in Pittsburgh, I took a trip up to Jeanette, Pennsylvania to see DJ of DJ's Trains. He is a very knowledgeable model railroad and you're going to want to see some of the things that he has to offer. Uh, he has a lot of great information. He's been a CSX engineer for over 20 years and he knows his stuff on model railroading and railroading in general. I urge you to go and see his site, DJ's Trains. I'll have a link in the description here for his YouTube channel, for his website, for his Instagram, well maybe not the Instagram, for his Twitter account. I'm not too sure about Instagram. I don't know how to get on it and neither does he. So if you would like to see more videos like this go ahead and ding that bell and you got to do a lot more things right now because youtube has changed things again and even though you ding that bell you got to go in and say how you want it done and how often you want it done so go do that right now on both my channel and dj's channel because you'll learn a lot from the both of us he showed me something where I used to work, the track plans of the Monga Hill Connecting Railroad. It was in a magazine, and I'll show you it right up here. So let's get going with that right now to see what he has. Here we are at, Look at me. DJ's <laughs> Trains. We're going to do a little video of his layout here in Jeanette, Pennsylvania, and he's going to tell you about it, walk you through his whole layout. I learned a lot from him. Yes. I, I think we others. learned a lot from each other. This is one cool guy. I'm yeah. telling you. <laughs> subscribe, stay subscribed, and check out all the videos. Take the day off. Just go start watching videos. Yeah, Just watch his videos binge too. Binge watch. Binge <laughs> watch. That's better than Netflix. This is DJ in Jeanette, Pennsylvania. We took a trip up to Jeanette to visit DJ and his railroad. Can What's you... up, everybody? Hey, <laughs> first of all, if this is your first time seeing the layout, this has been a couple of years of work. To me, the joy I get is recreating what I grew up riding my bike to. Ever since I was a little kid, I used to ride my bike down to the steel mill. And yes, from Pittsburgh, I say still, okay, instead of steel. And people criticize Steel me, mill, yeah. Steel mill of Edgar Thompson in Braddock, Pennsylvania, all the way to the different areas that I used to ride my bike to. Still working on one, one last scene. And for me, that's, this is what model railroading is about, is trying to recreate a favorite memory. The railroad is set into the 1980s period and allows me to uh, relive that time. So I'm really enjoying having Tom here. This is one of my favorite guys on YouTube. <laughs> so I was so excited. Oh, you thank know? you. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to post some stuff about Tom on my channel too to prom promote him. Uh, this is N scale. I know Tom's HO, but together, I mean, there's so much that uh, we hope that we can help answer any questions. So check out both of our, our channels. Okay, can you tell the viewers a little bit about the different areas that, you know, people are not familiar with Pittsburgh? Okay, all right. So let's start with Edgar Thompson. And this was um, Andrew Carnegie's uh, big steel mill. Uh, the process here is there's, it's the last steel mill in Pittsburgh has two blast furnaces. The, um, the hot metal would go across the Monongahela River and it could go to the right down towards would be Homestead or to the left, which is a modeling with Duquesne, Pennsylvania. Now, what I like about Duquesne, Pennsylvania is they have a uh, river to rail and they have uh, this picture in 2000 to, to recent. This is called the Big Blue Monster on the Mon, and I've made this in previous videos. But in the 80s, they had this little whirly bird crane. It would take coal from the barges to cover to uh, hoppers, take them up to North Bessemer, where the Bessemer Lake Erie would take it up to uh, Conneaut. So I like this area, still has a lot to go. Uh, now, if you've ever been to Pittsburgh, you've probably been to Kennywood, and, and you could see when you're up at Kennywood Amusement Park is you look down to the valley, they had the car shops. Uh, right now, this is where Kennywood's store and some of their excess roller coaster pieces. 
but the car shops were down there employed a, a lot of men and that is my representation. Now everything on this layout is 100% scratch built because we know that fine people at Walters refuse to make anything <laughs> Pittsburgh related, okay? Um, there's no glacier gravel. There's no new river mining here. There's no uh, the stuff that you see in the Walters catalog. Everything is 100% scratch built. I'm still working on this area. This is in Monroeville, Pennsylvania, the, the roundhouse, which is still in operation. Um, if you've ever scratch built a roundhouse, <laughs> it is the hardest thing you'll ever ever do. I'm still working on it. It's a work in progress. Uh, but I do have a working turntable and a heavy machinery uh, repair facility and a seven-stall diesel engine house. If you've ever seen, seen this area, it's a pretty good representation. I was there yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> now, back in the day... This is where I used to get chased out for, for trespassing. <laughs> you got a 14 year old kid on a bicycle, just wants to watch the trains go by and now yeah. I can do it. And there will be the water tower. People will say, oh, I remember that water tower was always here. So what about over in this area okay, over if you, here? If you go up through Penn Hills, Universal Atlas Cement, that was one of the, the biggest cement plants back in its time. And, and so they would bring in slag and the, the raw materials, a lot of the waste from the, uh, from the still mills. And there was uh, dumps, like a high line dump, and bags, they would make, uh, make the powdered cement and then ship it off in box cars. Now the plant closed, I think in like 1979, 1980, but it's going to live on, on my layout. And then last, you know, still working on this scene, this is the, the famous North Bessemer Yard. On North Bessemer Yard, Today is just a shell of its former self. It, it was a big yard where the Union Railroad and the Bessemer Lake Erie uh, would meet. Uh, the Union had some really great uh, engines. They had these things called Buffaloes that a lot of rail fans used to like. And in the Bessemer, they had the cool F7s and the SD9s SD, uh, with the high noses. And uh, so this was where they would exchange all the coal and iron ore. And so this is just the this is as far as I got so far. But it's going to look good when it's all done, I promise. Okay, and this is, what, 13 by 13 right here? Yeah, pretty sure, about 13 by 13. Okay. You can fit a lot in this area right here. Yeah. Now, the train's running pretty much uh, twice the normal track speed. It is DCC. It is mostly double track. But just like the prototype, it does go to single track when crossing the bridge over there. Now the Union runs sets of two, three, and five units at a time. And no, I am not running backwards. The Union Railroad always had, always went cab forward. They always made sure that their engines were facing cab forward for better visibility. So that is prototype accurate. Now I know a lot of guys do switching layouts and they have obsessions where uh, they have like a, a yard master or a dispatcher and all that stuff. I'm a scenery guy. I like to I just I like to watch the trains run. That's my thing. Is yeah. just I want to come. Like I work for the railroad. I've, I've been an engineer for 20 years. Uh, when I come home, I just sometimes want to just relax and watch trains run. Uh, you can invite me over your house for an op session, but I'm not going to follow the rules. I'm going to run full speed <laughs> and I'm just going to ooh and ah and take pictures and stuff. And Tom's been here for, for a few hours, and honestly, we this train has just been on continuous. We've talked about everything and anything, so I like the camaraderie, the, the friendship that comes out of doing this more than I like uh, following rules and timetables and stuff. It, this is just, uh, to me, what, what I like most about the hobby is just hanging out with the cool guys and talking, sharing some stories, some memories. and. So you you haven't been to Eric Call's house, have you? What? No, no. I, I, I know people that the other people don't know, and and they, they they're very strict. I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm coming over and we'll race trains. You know, if we have a double track main, I'm going to race my train against your train. Yeah, I'm the same way. I like to see them running around. Yeah. I don't like switching. I have, I I have a whole box full of switches that I <laughs> tore out because I didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> The, the Union, I, I was I was showing Tom the, the map from the 1950s and it was there's, there's got to be a million switches on on the prototype back in the day. I've had a downsize just because I, I they had crossovers like every mile they had crossovers. 
I just I'm gonna keep it simple type of guy. Just keep it simple. I want to watch trains, and it's not it's not for everybody, but this is what what I enjoy. I said I'm a scenery guy. I still got a lot more trees to make, and I, I just want to feel like I did back in the '80s as a kid, bike riding to my favorite spots. Mm -hmm. How long have you been working on this one here? Okay, I'm the guy that has been through a million layouts. <laughs> if you've ever watched my my channel, like. Then you used to have like a, a door layout right here that was clear to go. <laughs> yes, I had that. And I've had Pittsburgh layouts and I've had uh, freelance. But this one, I would say, is only about two years. And I work quick because I don't do things the way everyone else does. Everybody else does, let me do all my bench work first. Okay. Then they go and they put all their track and then scenery is an afterthought. And that's why they're not happy is they're like, well, I don't really know what to put in here. How do I like, see? I think scenery first. The earth was created before the railroad, and so that's why I always, with the exception of this area, which is, is flat, um, almost all the scenery is based on plywood, followed by up to two inches of foam. In some areas, I've done a couple layers of foam, and then you work your way down. That's how you get the realistic land formations. Like, if you look at this, we have the river is at one height, the coal docks is at another height, the um, Duquesne is at a third height, and that is how the prototype is. There's many levels, unless you're modeling Sandusky, Ohio, which I was at, <laughs> where it's so flat you can see the back of your head. Um, nothing really in North America is perfectly flat. So I, with the exception of one area that I wanted to keep uh, flat, I like to start with the, the styrofoam, work my way down. All the changes in elevation is going to make a more realistic the layout. Another thing that I see so many layouts, so many track plans, where they put their track right against the edge. Now, if you notice, there is scenery between, between me and the track. And this is how it is on the prototype. Uh, there is an access road along here, and you can look down and see the uh, turntable. So that's why I wanted to make sure I gave myself a couple inches to have that. So you. You're recreating the feel of riding your bike and looking down there. It also works for protection that uh, we've all lost. I lost my favorite <laughs> bottle car on a derailment. <laughs> so since then, I always have a couple inches all along. It's just for safety. That's probably the best advice I could ever give is give yourself some space between your track and your edge of your layout. That's a good bit of advice. Yeah. yeah, most modelers just put it all the way up to the edge. Yeah. Yeah. And then also, like, steel mill buildings are massive. Okay, these open hearths in, in the real world are, are just massive. And there would have been no, they, they would have been this long each. So instead, I did it just like the prototype. They are at an angle. And so you have to learn how to use force perspective and to use your angles so that you can get a lot of space. You don't have to model the whole building. You just model the fronts. I didn't have room to make the whole building that is here. There was an old engine house. So really, if I made this the, the, the full size, it would be coming down this way. But sometimes I'll, I'll park an old steam engine in here because this, this used to be a big engine facility. And then I weather everything because Nothing in life is clean. It, it, it's true. With the, with the railroads, everything is weathered. And weathering, that, to me, I know Tom was saying, <laughs> that's not one of your favorite things, but for me, uh, weathering is, is my favorite <laughs> thing. I can't make anything look, look nice and neat. I have, to, uh, I have to weather it. So the backdrop you have in there, it, I mean, that looks pretty good, you know, the way you blend in your scenery with the backdrop. Yeah, I'm, I'm still working on it. The, the backgrounds... Uh, I would rather have something than just the brick wall. Mm -hmm. That's nothing. I've seen some fantastic layouts, and, but if there's a train running past the TV or past the bookshelf or past the brick wall, that kind of ruined it. So even just a simple piece of, of uh, hardboard painted like a light blue, and go observe the sky because the sky isn't as blue as you think. I mixed, I made a video about making backdrops. There's more gray than blue in, in, in some of the skies. 
And sometimes like, when my daughter and I are driving somewhere at night and we see the sunset, like, look, the sky is pink. And you'll never see a model layout with a pink sky. Right. Sometimes the sky <laughs> is pink. Like, look, you can't make yourself, it's orange, it's pink. So take pictures because our eyes are also deceiving. Nobody thinks about the morning and the afternoon when the, when the color temperature is different. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a good thing with LED lights. You could yes. change. You could make the. Uh, that's what I'm working on too. Um, you could you can make a, the different uh, color temperatures, uh, different times of day with that. Now I have a small house. Uh, the ceiling is only six foot one, so I've had to go between the, the rafters to, to put some lighting up in here. This is the thing about the old houses. You make do with what you got. But I had a really good construction guy and uh, electrician. But unfortunately, I can't change the lighting. It's either on or off. Yeah. So if I had a bigger house, uh, maybe I'd get a, a bigger room and, and be able to change the lighting. Yeah, he has a, a duct right here. Yeah. And I'd say this right here is about five foot or five and a half foot. I would say um, about five three, five four, okay. somewhere around there. So I'm almost up to the ceiling right now so it's pretty low yeah that's that's the only downside. you don't need headroom though unless you got a double decker <laughs> yeah. this is the the only duck under and i think this as narrow as possible i would just simply have to detach a couple screws uh, or a couple of these bolts right here and this simply lifts off mm -hmm. all right very nice layout if if you're ever up in Pennsylvania, in Jeanette, which is close to Greensburg. Yeah, it's Tom Stomping Ground. Yeah, I used yeah. to live up this way. Yeah. Never, never knew he was here. <laughs> but yeah, I like having people over. I, I, I like teaching. I, I like sharing. And I, I see just a lot of people. I hate seeing everyone's layout look the same. Mm. That's why I teach scratch building. Because I've seen some people like, wow, that looks just like the Walters catalog right here. I want people to, to model what they want instead of what's just available. And it's easy. It's so much easier than you think. Uh, that's my big thing, the scratch building. <laughs> I just got this uh, about a year and a half ago, and it uh, works good for me. Something simple. I was, I was one of those people that was like the last to, to try DCC, but now that I got it, I'd never uh, go back to standard DC. So. Look for DJ doing some Arduino in the future. I'll, 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 I'll get him started in that. That's, that's the thing. It's like, so I had a fear of DCC till I watched some of these videos. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe it's not as bad. And now that Tom's explained, the first thing he did was pronounce, or I can't even say it, Arduino. <laughs> Arduino, yeah. It, it sounds like one of my relatives, my Italian relatives. <laughs> hey, your Arduinos are coming over. But uh, yeah, because I would like to eventually light up some of these buildings. And he was explaining how you can have different things come on at different times. And that's fascinating. So you don't have to have a big layout, have a small layout, and then enhance it with Arduino and the lighting effects. You don't size, like, like women say, size isn't everything. Yeah, put a lot of detail <laughs> into the area that you have. That's what makes makes a good railroad, model railroad. And he does a very good job over here with the different colors, different textures. I've changed things around because there is, like, you go on Google Maps, you look down at some of these areas uh, where they dump all the st steel mill residue and waste and how they reclaim it and how they mix things together. But then you can look at it from older pictures and it looks completely different. Mm -hmm. There's different buildings there. And then the next time you go by there and there's grass growing. So things are, are constantly in a state of change.